Good evening to all. It's my pleasure uh, to share with you the latest guidelines of the American Society of Echocardiography. Here are my dis disclosures. I'm a Speakers Bureau for Philips and Medtronic. So let's start this uh, if you check the latest issue of the American Journal of the American Society of Echocardiography, you have seen that the guidelines, the guidelines for the use of echocardiography in the evaluation of a cardiac source of embolism. This is a product of a three year three years of hard work on the members of my uh, committee. And here that them, uh, Alicia Armour from Duke University, Farouk, Ch uh, Farouk Chowdhury from Mount Sinai in New York, uh, Samir Arnaut from American University in Beirut, uh, Richard Grimm from Cleveland Clinic, Itzhak Kronzen from Lenox Hill in New York, uh, Bruce Landek from University of Colorado, uh, Kameswari Maganti from Northwestern in Chicago, Hector Michelena from Mayo Clinic, Kirsten Tolstrup from University of New Mexico, and myself from New York University. Let's try with the learning objective. What are we going to discuss in this uh, webinar? I'll first try to introduce the 2016 AAC guidelines on cardiac source of embolism, and this is the first set of guidelines from the American Society of Echocardiography that is specific to this topic. And we'll try to explain the clinical utility of these guidelines through figures, tables, videos, and uh, touch upon evaluation, report, reporting recommendation, and comparisons of echo modalities. And therefore, Further, we will discuss how these guidelines relate to the 2011 appropriate use um, criteria for echocardiography. So let's look at the cardiac source of emboli and the, what was the rationale for us to create these guidelines. The cardiac embolism accounts for a large number of ischemic stroke and systemic emboli. And paradoxical embolism, an embolism from the thoracic aorta, especially from its atheroma content, is responsible for additional cases of stroke and systemic embolism. And 2016 ASC guidelines on cardiac sources of emboli are the first set of guidelines that are specific to this topic. Now let's look at what are the clinical utility, what's the clinical utility of these guidelines. As you know, we as uh, echocardiographers, we practice both transthoracic and transesophageal echocardiography, and those imaging modalities happen to be cornerstones in the evaluation, diagnosis, and management of patients with systemic um, and paradoxical embolism. And we need a clear understanding of various types of cardiovascular conditions that are associated with cardioembolic stroke and their intrinsic risk to need to manage and diagnose cardiac sources of embolism. And how are we going to organize this presentation? This will be a presentation overview. We will first review potential cardiac sources of emboli. We will discuss the role of echocardiography in clinical management of cardioembolic stroke and systemic embolism. And we'll compare then echocardiography to other imaging modalities used for diagnosis of cardiac sources of emboli. And then we will, for each form of cardiac embolism, we will provide levels of recommendations. And throughout the guidelines, we, uh, we use the same format, and we have echocardiography recommended, echocardiography potentially useful, and echocardiography is not recommended. And you'll also, in this presentation, you'll see a couple of questions through which we will reinforce our learning objectives. So let's look at some of the stroke basics. Uh, stroke is the leading cause of death in disability worldwide. And in 2005, it is estimated that stroke accounts, accounted for 10% of all deaths worldwide. And more than 2,000 new strokes occur every day um, in the United States. And stroke incidence is declining in developing countries, largely due to better hypertension control and less tobacco use. So that's good news. And if you look at the Framingham, um, tri Framingham studies, and if you look at the incidents from the 1950s to the turn of the 21st century, you see that the stroke incidence has decreased in both in men and women. That's good. Unfortunately, the number of strokes will continue to rise in absolute numbers because of the aging population and therefore the importance of these guidelines. So stroke 
uh, can be named differently. In the United States, we often refer it as stroke, but we can also refer to it as the cerebrovascular uh, accident or CVA, and also sometimes as apoplexy. How is the stroke defined? Stroke is a rapid development of a focal neurologic deficit caused by disruption of blood supply to the corresponding area of the brain. And supply interruption may be due either to vessel blockage or vessel rupture. So therefore, we have a two major groups of strokes. If a stroke is caused by vessel blockage, we refer to that stroke as ischemic stroke. And if the vessel uh, ruptures, then it leads to the bleed inside the brain or another organ, and which we refer to that as hemorrhagic stroke. So now, what are the stroke types that we just discussed, ischemic and hemorrhagic? How frequent they are and what's the relative relationship between them? Here's the one study from 40,000 Danish patients, and you see that there is an uneven distribution between these two types of strokes. Um, ischemic stroke accounts for about 90% of all strokes, and hemorrhagic are about 10%. So ischemic mini-strokes that result spontaneously within 24 to 48 hours are called transient ischemic attacks, or TIA. Interestingly, uh, some hemorrhagic strokes did not start as hemorrhagic strokes per se, but rather they started as ischemic strokes that secondarily converted into hemorrhagic strokes. Now that we discussed ischemic versus hemorrhagic stroke, let's look at the subdivision of ischemic strokes. And those ischemic strokes are typically divided based on the so-called TOAST criteria, which is an acronym from a study that was published in 1993 and was actually a study of a particular medication. However, these criteria were found useful and continue to be used throughout the stroke literature. And these are the five major types of ischemic strokes from large vessel strokes uh, to cardioembolic strokes, which is our topic and the topic of our guidelines, then a small vessel strokes, cryptogenic strokes, and stroke due to other known causes. So large vessel strokes are related, for instance, to carotid and vertebral artery occlusion. Cardioembolic strokes we will discuss in detail. Small vessel strokes are lacuna infra, typically associated with hypertension and similar risk factors. Then cryptogenic strokes, strokes uh, in, for which we do not know exact etiology, and some of these cryptogenic strokes may be cardioembolic. And finally, stroke to do other causes, vasculopathies, hypercoagulable states, and so forth. So, I will ask you a question. So, let's start. This is a question and says cardiac embolism accounts for approximately what percentage of all causes of extreme stroke? And the choices are A, 5%, B, 15%, C, 30%, D, 50%, and E, 75%. So, would you like to uh, answer? So, uh, we have a variety of answers, but the majority of you answered correctly. The approximate percentage of strokes that are cardioembolic in origin is about 30%. Thank you very much. So now, let's look at this ischemic stroke subtypes, and we can look at the relative prevalence of ischemic stroke from a study in Rochester, Minnesota. There was a 454 patients, and you see this is the TOAST criteria. You see the distribution of them, and you see that about 29% we had the definitive cardioembolic stroke. That's roughly about one-third of all ischemic strokes are likely cardioembolic. And of course, there is another third is uh, cryptogenic, and some of them might actually be cardioembolic. But there's a proven uh, cause cardioembolic uh, strokes are about one-third of all ischemic strokes. So most of you answered correctly. So cardiac source and risk of embolism. Uh, not all uh, sources of cardiac embolism have the same embolic potential. So some have a much higher risk than the others. So what are the high-risk potential sources of cardiac embolism as opposed to moderate risk potential? So high risk are thrombi, whether they are related, uh, intracardiac thrombi, whether they are related to atrial fibrillation, myocardial infarction, cardiomyopathies, 
or mechanical or even bioprosthetic valve. Vegetation is another cause of high risk um, with a high risk embolic potential, valvular or non-valvular infective endocarditis. Tumors, particularly myxoma and papillary fibroelastoma, although hem- Histologically, they are benign tumors. They have a very malignant embolic potential. Um, and aortic atheroma is the extremely important cause of cardioembolic stroke. On the other, in the other side, a moderate risk thrombi and similar pathologies like a smoke and sludge inside the left atrium, left atrial appendage, or even left ventricle. A mitral stenosis with sinus rhythm it has an embolic potential even in the absence of apparent atrial fibrillation. Atrial flutter is also in a moderate risk for that. And then there is a whole series of valvular disorders that may have some embolic potential. Bioprosthetic valves, giant Lambert's excrescences, calcific aortic stenosis, mitral calcification, mitral valve prolapse, non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis. Uh, and finally, some pathologies related to the atrial septum. Uh, which is atrial septal aneurysm or patent foramen ovale. So how do clinicians suspect a cardioembolic stroke? We discussed how frequent it is. We discussed how they differ from other forms of stroke. But how do we suspect, if we are clinicians, how do we suspect that the stroke might be cardioembolic in origin? Because you remember, um, uh, H, uh, arterial tree is a large organ from the heart to all the arteries throughout the body. So, how do we presume that the source is cardioembolic? So, if you look at the brain, we see there is a sudden onset of often severe neurologic deficit, typically without a prodrome. In a cardioembolic stroke, multiple brain lesions occur in multiple vascular territories. And often, cardioembolic strokes are recurrent. There are waves of emboli over a short period of time. And the diagnosis of cardioembolic stroke is a further supported if there is embolism to other organs like spleen, kidney. And if those organs also are infarcted at the time when there is a, a brain infarct, which is a stroke, so then we have strong suspicion that um, strokes and these other infarcts can be cardioembolic in origin. And of course, um, we do not diagnose strokes by echocardiography. We just look for conditions that might lead to uh, cardioembolic strokes. So CT and MR of the brain or other organs is the mainstay of establishing the diagnosis of a stroke. But here is an example, uh, thanks to a colleague uh, from NYU and from the radiology department. So this is an MRI of the brain in a patient with atrial fibrillation that nicely illustrates the essence of cardioembolic stroke. In the left column, you will see that the patient has so-called the diffusion weighted images, and the right column is apparent diffusion coefficient. And in the left column, you actually see the patient first had an embolic stroke to the right middle cerebral artery. That's the thick uh, arrows. You see there is a large stroke, and as evolves over several days. And while that stroke in that territory evolving, he has developed three weeks later a new stroke in the territory of the left middle cerebral artery. And this is the essence. You have a multiple vascular territories, sudden onset, evolution over time, and um, multiplicity of symptoms. And therefore, multiple territories, multiple periods of time, multiple stages of development of that stroke. And this is in contrast to uh, non-embolic strokes like uh, watershed infarcts on the left of figure A. You see that our arrow points to watershed infarct at the boundary of two vascular territories, like right anterior and right middle cerebral artery. And those, while they, some of them might be embolic, they often occur in a generalized loss of perfusion, such a generalized hypotension. Also, cardioembolic strokes should be differentiated, for instance, from lacuna strokes, which are small lesions that are often associated with hypertension. So, how did we, once we looked at that, how can we use echocardiography to diagnose potential sources of, echocardi- uh, of cardiac, cardi- uh, cardioembolic stroke? In our guidelines, we have a 
a large section that provides you with the very practical guidelines on how to use various echocardiographic techniques to evaluate cardiac sources of embolism. And here we discuss practical recommendations, very, very practical, and how to various these techniques can be used in the diagnosis of cardiac sources of embolism. We discuss 2D fundamental and harmonic imaging. We discuss 3D and motile plane imaging. We discuss saline and transpulmonary contrast. And we discuss Doppler imaging. And finally, we discuss off-axis and non-standard views and sweeps, which are often important to establish uh, the diagnosis of a cardiac source of embolism. For instance, here's a, um, one image from, one figure from a guideline that nicely illustrates the right ventricular apical thrombus. That was this, the diagnosis established only because we used the RV focused view with an inferior sweep. So remember, if you're looking for uh, causes of cardioembolic stroke, use all those what you do on a routine basis, but also do focused views, sweeps, and off-axis views. So we provided our first recommendation in the guidelines is the general recommendation on the use of echocardiography in patients with potential cardiac source of embolism. And here we say, you see the general concept of our guidelines, you see echocardiography recommended, echocardiography potentially useful, and echocardiography not recommended. Um, and we say that echocardiography should be considered in all patients with suspected cardiac source of embolism, especially in patients for whom clinical therapeutic decisions such as anticoagulation or cardioversion depend on echocardiographic findings. On the other extreme, we said that echocardiography is not recommended in patients for whom results would not guide therapeutic decisions. So fair, just knowing for the, uh, for, the, just for the reason to know it is not sufficient. It has to really guide therapeutic decisions. We also here discuss uh, what to do, whether you should do transthoracic or transesophageal echocardiography in a particular case. So transesophageal echocardiography is not indicated when transthoracic echocardiography findings are diagnostic for a cardiac source of emboli. On the other hand, we can say that transthoracic may be unnecessary when TE is already planned for evaluation of intracardiac mass, or static valve, or thoracic aorta, or when TE is used to guide a percutaneous procedure related to a cardiac source of emboli. We also, in our guidelines, which are clinical guidelines, we also touch upon uh, appropriate use criteria for the same topic. So there is a difference between the clinical guidelines that we provide uh, as opposed to appropriate use criteria, which are primarily uh, designed to look at the population and to look at the most efficient and cost-effective way to establish the diagnosis. An appropriate use criteria is that provides a large list of every possible condition in which we use echocardiography. What we did as a committee, we have culled from that large group of um, appropriate criteria. We uh, have selected those that refer specifically to cardiac source of emboli. And here, these are, uh, this is the list of appropriate use criteria for transthoracic echocardiography as well as the transesophageal echocardiography. Of course, this is not meant to be memorized. This is meant as to be a lookup table. When you have a question about a particular condition, you just go to the guidelines and look it up, whether it's appropriate or inappropriate. Similarly, we have the inappropriate use for both transthoracic and transesophageal echocardiography, so you can use it as a nice reference whenever in doubt. So let's look at a couple of examples of these cardiac sources of emboli. And atrial fibrillation is one of them uh, and one of the most important ones. So atrial fibrillation, as you know, this irregular pulse associated with rapid chaotic rhythm of atrial fibrillation has been known to clinicians for centuries. However, it took the advent of EKG at the turn of the 20th century before the definitive diagnosis of atrial fibrillation could be established. And this is, for instance, one of the first published recording of uh, atrial fibrillation from 1912, and it was done by Thomas Lewis, a British physician who is considered the father of clinical um, EKG. And how often, uh, why is it so important? Because atrial fibrillation is the most prevalent sustained arrhythmia in clinical practice, and it's 1% uh, of population, general population, has atrial fibrillation. However, the rate of atrial fibrillation increases markedly with age. And if you happen to live to, uh, to be 80, 
the likelihood that one person of that age will have atrial fibrillation is as high as 10 to 15 percent. In the United States, Western Europe, Japan, and other uh, industrially developed countries, non-valvular atrial fibrillation is the most common form of atrial fibrillation. That is to say, atrial fibrillation not related to rheumatic mitral disease, as opposed to valvular atrial fibrillation, which typically means related to rheumatic mitral stenosis, which remains probably the most prevalent form of uh, atrial fibrillation worldwide. And what's the embolic potential of atrial fibrillation? It's an estimated about 15% of all ischemic strokes um, are related to atrial fibrillation. And annual risk of atrial fibrillation is about 2 to 10% on average, about 5% for any individual patient. So now I'll ask you another question. A non valvular atrial fibrillation is the leading cause of cardiac thromboembolism. What is the most common site of thrombus formation in patients with non valvular atrial fibrillation? And again, you'll have five choices A, body of the left atrium, B, left atrial appendage, C, interatrial septum, D, body of the right atrium, and E, right atrial appendage. So try to answer now. Okay. So, the vast, vast majority, 95% of you answered correctly that it's the left atrial appendage is the site, and that's what we have to pay special attention to it. Excellent. What's the pathogenesis of cardiac embolism? Atrial fibrillation, as you know, leads to mechanical dysfunction of left atrium, left atrial appendage, which then leads to blood stasis, and there are two separate phenomena that are related to blood uh, stays in atrial fibrillation. One is the red blood cell aggregation or rouleau formation, which leads to echocardiographic findings, and as well as clot formation, on the other hand, in the serum. So uh, red cell aggregates uh, are seen on echocardiography by smoke and sludge, while the true clot formation is essentially referred as thrombi. So while smoke and sludge are not directly related to embolism, they're actually markers of uh, blood stasis, left atrial appendage dysfunction, and the potential for cardioembolic stroke. In our guidelines, we clearly state that uh, uh, left atrial appendage is the most common site of clot formation in atrial fibrillation, but look at this. It's interesting, in non valvular atrial fibrillation, that's almost always left atrial, uh, that the thrombi are located in left atrial appendage. Very small number of people with non valvular atrial fibrillation will have clots in the body of the left atrial appendage. This is a contrast to valvular atrial fibrillation that is associated with the, uh, rheumatic mitral stenosis, that, that where about one third of all thrombi can be in the body of the left atrial appendage. But from us, from the echocardiography perspective, because most AF-related thrombi are located in left atrial appendage, and because left atrial appendage cannot reliably be visualized by transthoracic echocardiography, we then can state that transesophageal echocardiography is the primary means of diagnosing aortic atrial fibrillation-associated thrombi. And, as you know, there is a spectrum of finding in atrial fibrillation, and we provide uh, many images uh, in our documents. For instance, this is somebody with atrial fibrillation with a normally contracting left atrial appendage, and neither, there is no smoke, sludge, thrombus. So presence of atrial fibrillation, good uh, contractility, does not necessarily mean that the patient will have any of the abnormal findings that we just discussed. However, it's more common to have some other findings, such as smoke, and here we define the smoke, can have a sludge and a frank thrombus. Now, in a series of videos, it's easier to actually to see. This is the smoke that we define as dynamic swirling echoes under optimal gain sending settings. Then we can look at the sludge. Um, it's the dynamic gelatinous echo similar to a meniscus level without the discrete mass. Um, and you can see that it's like a smoke on the top, but it's a very non-clearing echo density in the bottom of the left atrial appendage. And finally, you can have clear thrombus, which is a defined mass inside the left atrial appendage here, but can be in the body of the left atrium as well. So, and then I mean the guidelines, we also emphasize that the importance of measuring emptying velocity by spectral Doppler, and this is how you do it. This is somebody 
to normal. Normal velocities are typically greater than 40 centimeters per second. And this is somebody with uh, abnormal velocity, that emptying velocity less than 20 centimeters per second is particularly indicative of poor left atrial appendage function and a higher risk for clot formation and therefore for cardioembolic risk. So, this is directly from the guidelines. See, actually, at the top, you see that the relatively preserved emptying velocity is somebody who is atrial fibrillation. And paradoxically, after cardioversion, the velocities decrease. Uh, therefore, even after cardioversion, when you reestablish electrical normality, which is the sinus rhythm, there is no reestablishment of normal mechanical function. Uh, immediately post cardioversion, there is electromechanical dissociation, and that is probably the reason why people post cardioversion are at risk, at high risk of clot formation, cardioembolic potential, unless they are anticoagulated. And then here, this is again in the guidelines, you provide examples of smoke uh, and mobile thrombi on both 2D and 3D echocardiography. And then here, this is the guidelines. Uh, about the left atrium and left atrial appendage. And here we say that the transthoracic is recommended in patients with suspected uh, left atrial, left atrial appendage thrombus to assess LV size and function and the underlying causes. But we emphasize the transesophageal echocardiography is the primary means uh, of establishing clot formation inside the left atrium and the left atrial uh, appendage. We also emphasize the importance of uh, microbubble or trans pulmonic contrast to differentiate those clots for potential uh, tumors. Let's go on to left ventricular thrombus, a related topic. And uh, left ventricular thrombus, let's look at the in overview, a basic characteristic. Typically, LV thrombi are associated with hypokinetic or akinetic or aneurysmal LV segments. And LV thrombi can be seen in both ischemic and non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. And ischemic LV thrombi can occur with either acute myocardial infarction or after chronic remodeling of the left ventricle in creation of left ventricular aneurysm. And imaging recommendations, because LV is in anterior chest, LV thrombi are typically better seen by transthoracic echocardiography than by transesophageal echocardiography. And use of microbubble or transpulmonary contrast agent enhances the diagnostic utility um, of uh, looking for LV thrombi. And here, this is an example, a highlight, ischemic cardiomyopathy prior to modern therapy. 35% of patients with recent myocardial infarction uh, would have developed mural thrombi, if not anticoagulated, and 40% would have embolized within four months, giving rise to a variety of systemic embolic uh, disorders. And non-ischemic cardiomyopathy annual risk is estimated to be 3.5%. That's a significant embolic potential. And then here, let's say an example, we don't provide cases in the guidelines clearly, but it, we emphasize the importance that all echocardiography findings should be taken in the context of clinical findings of a patient. So let's say this is 24-year-old man with acute myocardial infarction three weeks earlier and now presents with bilateral low extremity thromboemboli. Clearly his EKG shows a completed anthroceptal wall myocardial infarction. And then let's look at the echocardiogram. And now the chambers are labeled in this still image. This is apical uh, four-chamber view. And let's play it. And now you can actually see that the apex is akinetic. There is a mass that's a mobile and associated with akinetic segment. So that should be a strong consideration that this might be a thrombus. And then... In another case, 52-year-old woman with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy now presents with the recent sudden onset of left-sided weakness. Apical four-chamber with the zoom to the LV apex. This is before we give a contrast, and this is after we gave microbubble contrast. And you notice that using the microbubble contrast, we can enhance our diagnosis, and you see that it's the absence of contrast uptake by this mass indicative of a thrombus because the thrombus is a vascular structure that it's easier maybe to see on a moving image. So this is before we gave the microbubble contrast and this is after we gave the microbubble contrast. So clearly notice the absence of contrast uptake by a thrombus. And why we are emphasize this? 
See, this is because it's very important, and this is in the guidelines itself. For the, so we have a panel with somebody with a non-contrast imaging and a val- value of a contrast imaging in panel B, and also an apical three-chamber view for a LV mobile thrombus. And if you happen to receive your latest issue of the Journal of American Society of ECHO, and you look at the title page, you will actually see that the image from panel B is right at the front of our journal. And then here we provide guidelines from the LV thrombus, and we clearly emphasize, you can look at, look at the details, but we emphasize two things, that LV thrombus is typically better visualized by a transthoracic rather than transesophageal echocardiogram on in many instances, and we emphasize the value of transpulmonary or microbubble contrast in helping us to diagnose thrombus and differentiate it from other masses such as tumors. And this is an example how you would differentiate between the tumor and the thrombus. Um, this is an example of somebody with a clear known diagnosis of a tumor. This is left ventricular lymphoma, 41-year-old woman with the HIV-associated Burkitt lymphoma. And now you can actually see that there is a mass inside the left ventricle, but you can see that there is a clearly uptake of the contrast. And when I put the, this image to move, you can see that this mass is in the context of a normally moving ventricle. So, takes up the contrast and occurs in, uh, without warm motion abnormalities that argues strongly against the mass being a thrombus but supports the diagnosis of being a tumor. So here, patient number one, thrombus, no uptake, and this is lymphoma, uptake. So we look both the uptake of the contrast and regional wall motion um, to establish the difference between a thrombus and a clot. So this is differential diagnosis, summarizes that LV thrombus, a kinetic segment, does not take up the contrast, and LV tumor, typically wall motion is normal, and there is an uptake of the contrast if the tumor is vascular. So let's look at the now switch to cardiac tumors, and then uh, question number three. So be prepared to answer. So cardiac tumors are a potential cause of cardiac embolism. Which of these tumors is the most likely to cause a disabling stroke? Again, you have five choices. Choice A, sarcoma in the right ventricle. Choice B, papillary fibroelastoma of a tricuspid valve. C, lipoma in left atrial appendage. D, myxoma in the left atrium. E, rhabdomyoma in the left ventricle. Try to answer it now. So, let's see what, what you thought, which of these five. And... Two-thirds of you answered correctly that the most uh, embolic potential for a disabling stroke is the myxoma in the left atrium, both because of its histology and the embolic potential and both for its location. Tumors in the right heart are unlikely to cause disabling stroke because it would require also to be uh, paradoxically transferred from the right heart into the left heart. That's good. So you answered all three questions, the majority of our asset correctly, that's a very nice. So cardiac tumors, most cardiac tumors are metastases of non-cardiac malignancies, lung, breast, stomach, colon. However, even in patients with systemic malignancies, you should not automatically assume that the intracardiac tumor is a metastasis. So all cardiac tumors, if you look at it, about 90% are secondary tumors, metastases from non-cardiac tumors and about 10% are primary tumors. And the vast majority of primary tumors, about three quarters, are benign, such as myxoma, papillary fibroelastoma, and lipoma, while about 25% are malignant, and uh, among them are sarcoma, such as angiosarcoma, uh, rhabdomyosarcoma, and so forth. And so what do we say in the guidelines, and what do we provide? We have provided very nice images, uh, both still and moving images, so for instance, of myxoma here on a transesophageal echocardiogram together with the histology of uh, left atrial myxoma, but also you can establish the diagnosis, and we show this by transthoracic echocardiography, nice myxoma of the left atrium, the plopping through the mitral valve in a phenomenon called uh, tumor plop. And then... We also provide another tumor with a high embolic potential, again, benign tumor. It's a papillary fibroelastoma. Here's an example of papillary fibroelastoma of the aortic valve. And here we provide both in 2D and 3D transesophageal echocardiography as well as histology of this tumor. 
And that's, those are very easy to recognize in most instances um, by when you have a moving image. And what do we say about recommendations for evaluation of cardiac tumors? And we say the complete transthoracic is recommended for all patients suspected of having cardiac tumors. But we again emphasize that the T is more often uh, more valuable. And we also emphasize the importance of transpulmonary or microbubble contrast in differentiating uh, tumors, whether it's a vascular tumors from non-vascular structures such as thrombi. And let's me give you a, a quick example of the left atrial myxomas so that this is, again, you take a clinical context, 62-year-old woman, prior history of ovarian cancer, presents with shortness of breath and dizziness and chest CT, no pulmonary pathology, and incidental finding of a left atrial mass, and they say it's a tumor versus thrombus. But when we looked at this, Actually, you can see really, this is a transesophageal echocardiogram in a bicaval view, and you see that the well-circumscribed mass on the left atrial side of the fossa ovalis and a heterogeneous in appearance, and this is essentially almost diagnostic of left atrial myxoma. You see the location, heterogeneous nature. Um, and then if you give a contrast, microbubble contrast, myxoma will appear sort of halfway between a truly vascular tumor and a thrombus. Because of heterogeneous nature, you can actually see that there is a part of the tumor that uh, takes up the contrast and part does not. It's often seen with myxomas. Okay? And then you can actually use also 3D echocardiography to locate this tumor. This is from right atrial side, and we'll now turn it to the left atrial side and see typical location of the myxoma on the left atrial side of the fossa of Alice. And this is the myxoma. These are the clinical characteristics, most common primary cardiac tumor, and these are all the other characteristics that you can read, and some 7% of myxomas are familial as a part of the Carney syndrome. Papillary fibroblastoma is another important uh, source of embolism. This is, again, clinical case presentation, 63-year-old man, two-week history of fevers and chills following tooth extraction. So clinically, it was suspected that might be endocarditis. It has a recent episode amaurosis fugar, uh, vision loss, and actually you can see it here on the aortic side of the aortic valve. There is a rounded mass that it has a characteristic of papillary fibroelastoma. And it's actually much easier to see it on a moving image. So essentially you see that a biplane view of the aortic. It's a very characteristic gelatinous um, a mobile mass a uh, very characteristic appearance, and then here on a 3D, you can actually see uh, that uh, papillary fibroelastoma of the aortic valve. It can occur on any other valve inside the heart, but on the aortic valve is uh, prominent. And then you can diagnose it also by CT. Probably CT and MR are not as important for papillary fibroelastoma. However, for any other cardiac tumors, rhabdosarcoma, myosarcoma, lipoma, these radiologic imaging uh, might be more important than echocardiography, establishing the true nature of the tumor. And so this is histology. This is uh, a vascular front, so papillae, and then uh, aligned with an endocardium. Sometimes it says that it's not a true tumor, um, but it's still in the benign nature of the disease. They might recur as well. So this is papillary fibroelastoma and teaching point that papillary fibroelastoma are the most common valvular tumors of the human heart. Now vegetation is another cause of emboli, but it's a high potential. And then uh, basic features, as you know, this in the absence of intravenous drug use or implantation of indwelling catheters and devices, infective endocarditis is actually a rare disorder. Uh, the prevalence of prosthetic endocarditis is approximately 250-fold higher than that of native endocarditis. And a true rate of vegetation embolism is unknown because we do not do imaging, uh, brain imaging or stem imaging in all patients with a vegetation. So we don't really don't know, but we know that it's uh, likely very high. And the vegetation appear on echocardiography as irregular shaggy masses with independent motion. And two criteria are used for diagnose infective endocarditis. And here's a little... Uh, illustration, how do we use? Do criteria have major criteria and minor criteria? And the diagnosis established by some combination of the two is to establish diagnosis. You have either to have two major criteria, one major and three minor, or five minor criteria. But in clinical practice, which most often essentially what we need is the positive blood cultures and echocardiogram is ordered. And then if we find finding typical of vegetation, we can with certainty establish the diagnosis of infective endocarditis. And essentially, it's a couple of case presentations, 55-year-old man, several-month history of intermittent fevers, fatigue, 
and stimuli symptoms and no history of intravenous drug abuse. And blood cultures grew viridans streptococci, that the organism typical for endocarditis. In the brain, there were numerous microemboli, which were clinically silent. And then you can clearly see large vegetation, irregularly shaped, highly mobile. Um, and these vegetations are typically associated with uh, valvular um, insufficiency. If I move this into a color, you can see there is a severe mitral regurgitation, which is um, often finding with large vegetation. You can also see vegetations on prosthetic valves. This is the bioprosthetic valves in somebody with the MSSA bacteremia, Staphylococcus aureus. The bioprosthetic valve, transthoracic, you see the large masses associated with the leaflets of bioprosthetic valves. And then if you put the color, surprisingly, there is no regurgitation, but there is a clear channeling of blood indicative of some degree of prosthetic stenosis. And it's easier to see that on uh, transesophageal echocardiography. Uh, you can clearly a large mass uh, on the atrial side of a prosthetic uh, mitral valve. Again, no regurgitation, but significant stenosis. So what do we emphasize in the guidelines? We provide first pictures of all these findings um, or complications of endocarditis, such in this uh, nice example of an aortic root abscess and here, what do we emphasize? We emphasize that the, uh, in many instances, transthoracic is sufficient, but the TEE is often superior, particularly for prosthetic valve endocarditis, as well as for complications of endocarditis, such as fistula formation, uh, abscess formation, and so forth. And we also list condition in which transesophageal echocardiography, or echocardiography in general, is not recommended. Um, then we address also the topic of non-bacterial endocarditis um, in which there are no microorganisms, but they are just a thrombi uh, formation and uh, de uh, debris on, on valve. This is non-bacterial endocarditis of a mitral valve in somebody with the antiphospholipid syndrome. We provide both still and uh, moving image, and you can see the moving image, typical finding on the atrial side of the leaflets. There are masses that are typically occur in a kissing fashion, you see them both on the anterior and the posterior leaflet. So an example of somebody with antiphospholipid syndrome, sometimes referred as the Lipman sachs endocarditis. We also provide uh, examples of another uh, non-bacterial endocarditis, which is marantic endocarditis associated with the chronic debilitation and uh, um, malignancies. And here what we say with respect to non-infective cardiocarditis, that transthoracic echocardiography surveillance in patients with primary antiphospholipid is recommended because of the high incidence of non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis in these patients. But we also say that the routine surveillance in patients with lupus erythematosus uh, with secondary uh, antiphospholipid syndrome is okay, but should not be done in any patient with lupus without uh, absence of something that would suspect valvular disease. And we also have other valvular pathologies. Um, we discuss uh, Lambeau's excrescences and strands, for instance, here on the aortic valve in a nice example. Um, you can actually see that as it moves, that it's a fine filamentous uh, strands on the ventricular side of the aortic valve. They can occur on other valves. And what do we say in our guidelines about this? Uh, we can say that the valvular strains and labral excrescences, we say that uh, to our knowledge, there is no way to distinguish strains uh, and lumbar excrescences by echocardiography. And we also we say that in summary, there is currently no robust evidence that uh, native or prosthetic valve strains are causative of systemic embolism. Um, then we also address the topic of another common finding, which is mitral annular calcification associated with the accumulation of the calcium, typically in the posterior aspect of the mitral annulus, both by 2D and 3D. And in the guidelines, we say that the echocardiography can establish the diagnosis of mitral annular calcification. However, mitral annular calcification are typically an incidental finding and are likely to be an independent cause of cardiac excess of emboli in most patients. And then finally, we have uh, examples of thrombi, both associated with, for instance, bioprosthetic valves, and you can see it here, large thrombus, high embolic potential, and as well as a mechanical prosthesis. Here's a still image. You can see in a diastole in a systolic frame, see a large mass and inability of the prosthesis to fully open. Easier to appreciate in 
in a moving image. You see that the leaflet, that is close to the aortic valve on the right side of the screen, moving sort of normally, but the one opposite it is completely stuck, and there is a large mass underneath, indicative of a thrombus underneath that prosthetic valve. So what do we say about recommendation for prosthetic valve thrombosis, that are both transthoracic and T are indicated when there is a suspicion of such complication, and we also recommend interval or repeat studies are considered appropriate for re-evaluation of this condition, um, and that T or TTE are recommended for evaluation of thrombolysis therapy success uh, when such therapy is administered to treat uh, prosthetic thrombosis. And we also touched upon a, a related condition with PANUS, which by itself may not be a anabolic potential, but has a differential diagnosis with uh, thrombus and vegetation formation on prosthetic valves. And uh, finally, one an important cause of a high impact or high potential source is the aortic atheroma. And as I said, this is cardiac source of uh, atheroma, there's the basic features in atheromatous plaque and ascending aorta. Aortic arch is a well-established source of systemic embolism. The risk of embolism is related to plaque thickness and plaque's complexity. High-risk features include plaque thickness of uh, 4 millimeters or more, plaque ulceration, and particularly if there are mobile components which represent superimposed thrombi. Plaque from descending aorta can embolize retrograde if there is particular aortic regurgitation. An imaging recommendation, the plaque in the ascending aorta and arches typically cannot be fully uh, uh, visualized by transthoracic echocardiography, and therefore transesophageal echocardiography is primary echographic means of diagnosing and characterizing aortic plaques. So, let's look at an example. This is a normal aortic arch, smooth, and somebody with severe calcific plaque. We can look at that uh, by, uh, in videos, normal arch, and severe plaque. And also we can look at the complex plaques, uh, ulcerated plaque, and uh, mobile plaque. Let's look at this uh, on, uh, on a video image and mobile image, somebody with the mobile plaque, high embolic potential. And what do we say about, and we can look at this also with the 3D, um, this is on a 3D of a normal arch and ulcerated arch, and this is what we pro provide in the guidelines, uh, the types of plaques that are present histologically, and then provide examples of plaques, and we also say that uh, echocardiography is recommended in preferred, the T is preferred modality, and potentially used to maybe seen on transthoracic echocardiography, but that's low yield. But also, we, in, throughout the guidelines for every topic, we say that these guidelines also uh, dovetail other guidelines by the American Society of Echo, such as cardiac surgery and percutaneous interventions, and we have multimodality imaging, for instance, for the order, and we refer the reader to such potential. So it's, we are almost out of time, and we have discussed all the major forms of embolism, and the remainder, you can do it on your own, which is a paradoxical embolism, and also we discussed the embolism in pediatric uh, population. Uh, so I hope you enjoy it. We have a couple of questions that are related for mitral annular calcification with mobile components, or mitral annular calcifications that are complex. So sometimes these masses are referred as toothpaste tumors, or uh, mitral annular calcifications that uh, have calcification, that are uh, that caseating, that are essentially uh, liquefying inside, and those might have a higher potential, embolic potential than uh, typical mitral annular calcification, which are still, and the management, some of you asked about the management, it really should be individualized uh, per patient, and uh, Sometimes uh, they might need surgery to remove, but in most instances, much lunar calcification are a benign finding. So what to do in somebody with the endothelialized thrombus? Essentially, this is a general question uh, regarding what to do in somebody uh, with the <coughs> chronic thrombus that has endothelialized and whether that should be um, anticoagulation uh, provided. That's really, there are these guidelines that we have are not uh, therapeutic guidelines, and there are therapeutic guidelines by uh, societies such as the American Society, American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology, and I would refer you to those guidelines. So these are primarily diagnostic guidelines. 
So as somebody asked that there is an incidental finding of papillary fibroelastoma of the aortic valve without no um, uh, uh, neurologic events or systemic embolism. So uh, that is very difficult to provide generalized guidelines about a papillary fibroelastoma because this is a rare, con relatively rare condition. There are no uh, randomized trials like in most of the conditions that we discussed here. So it's a difficult. Sometimes it is said that uh, without um, embolic, but, uh, uh, depending also on the size, so a small incident, the finding of a small uh, papillary fibroelastoma without uh, embolic event is sometimes said that can be conservatively managed and that the treatment is done with the first onset of neurologic symptoms. Sometimes it advocated antiplatelet therapy or anticoagulation, but these are more based on uh, expert uh, consensus rather than a true um, data from randomized trials. So somebody asked a good question, do you recommend a bubble study for every person that has had a stroke? Uh, if you look at the, our guidelines, we specifically address this issue, and essentially we say that the paradoxical embolism is often part of a, a evaluation for cryptogenic stroke or rare causes of stroke. And we say that the uh, uh, using a bubble injection to establish uh, intracardiac or intrapulmonary shunt probably has a higher yield in younger people with, uh, with stroke because they have less competing reasons to have a stroke. However, as the patient gets older and older, 70, 80, 90, the likelihood that the paradoxical embolism will be caused will be caused the stroke is very low. So one may recommend that essentially in an elderly population who have other identifiable causes or potential causes such as aortic atheroma or atrial fibrillation, probably the yield is better there rather than doing um, bubble study and looking for uh, a paradoxical embolism in somebody with the competing causes of stroke. So uh, somebody has asked, is it appropriate to perform medical cardiac in cases where the patient has a diagnosis of hemorrhagic stroke by CTOMR? Uh, so as we discussed, the hemorrhagic stroke represents about 10% of all strokes. Some hemorrhagic strokes start truly as hemorrhagic strokes. Uh, extreme severe hypertension, ruptured vessel. In those cases, probably just to establish the diagnosis, uh, it, it, there is the, the yield of echocardiography directly related to stroke is low. However, we have also discussed that some of hemorrhagic strokes uh, didn't start at hemorrhagic stroke, but they were really conversion from ischemic stroke. And in those instances, uh, echocardiography should or should not be performed based on the guidelines that we provided for other conditions. Somebody asked is, can we use transpulmonary contrast in the setting of acute MI day two or three? Uh, so again, these are specific guidelines that we use for cardio, uh, thoracic, uh, cardiac cause of emboli, and I would refer uh, the person who asked this question to a specific guidelines that the American Society of Echoes published, uh, I believe, uh, uh, last year that specifically addresses uh, uh, this, uh, the use of contrast. There's also a sonography guidelines on the use of contrast and a micro bubble contrast. Uh, so in principle, uh, the, the major contraindication for use of micro bubble contrast is a known intracardiac shunt with the right to left or bidirectional shunting. Uh, so therefore, that would be the, the uh, thinking about using the, the, uh, the contrast in somebody with an acute myocardial infarction. But again, I would recommend specific guidelines to be consulted. So uh, this is somebody asked, uh, is it appropriate to use a contrast agent to evaluate uh, thrombus in the left atrial appendage? As we pointed out uh, in our guidelines, we specifically address the usefulness of transpulmonary or microbubble contrast in sometimes when we are in a doubt, uh, establishing uh, the difference between a thrombus or uh, let's say myxoma or similar tumor inside the left atrial appendage. So um, we find it useful uh, to be used. So again, somebody asked, would you use a bubble contrast in somebody with a hemorrhagic stroke? Again, we already discussed hemorrhagic stroke often are not related uh, to um, cardioembolic embolism, whether paradoxical or not, and in many instances probably is not appropriate, but again, has to be individualized because some hemorrhagic stroke might be conversion from an ischemic stroke.
Okay. There is a lot of questions that are coming uh, about the difference between a warfarin and a new anti-agent or oral agent. I would not uh, try to answer those questions because then I would really, uh, again, point uh, uh, the audience to specific treatment guidelines, particularly those by the American Society, uh, American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, which are really in-depth guidelines and are specific to the topics uh, that you are asking. So uh, somebody asked, what's the difference between a fibroelastoma and lumbar excrescence? The lumbar excrescence and uh, strands are typically filamentous. Sometimes it could be very large, but there are filamentous uh, strands uh, rather than typically uh, globular appearance of a fibroelastoma. Also, fibroelastoma has a jelly-like appearance. It's a tiny balls that uh, with a powder, what's called a powder puff appearance. Uh, so it's really a uh, fibroblastoma is more defined a mass as opposed to lumbar excrescence, which is a set of strands. So again, somebody asked, should we do saline injections for all cryptogenic and cardioembolic strokes? And again, we said that should be uh, individualized, particularly depending on the patient's age and the likelihood that other causes of cardioembolic stroke might be present. Somebody asked, what's the frequency of embolization with bioprosthetic valves? We have addressed that question, and you can actually look at it in the guidelines. We provide the results from studies, exactly what uh, uh, large surveys, there is a VA study and the similar trials, so you can look at the exact, from, it differs from different studies. I hope you enjoyed the presentation, this interactive nature, and, uh, and I hope I answered uh, most of your questions.